Okay, this is Katie Bodine and we are going to talk about osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is a skeletal disease and it's characterized by low bone mass. Basically, there is a deterioration of the bone tissue, which results in disruption of bone architecture, then compromised bone strength and often uh, there's a subsequent fracture or at least an increased risk of fracture. And I will point out the difference between osteoporosis and osteomalacia. Um, osteomalacia is actually due to impaired bone mineralization. And it's generally due to a severe vitamin D deficiency or abnormal vitamin D uh, metabolism. So you can see that separate lecture on that. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out quickly. As far as epidemiology, this is the most common bone disease in humans, and it's predominantly a disease of the elderly. It favors female sex over male sex, and although there's poor data on the incidence, um, there's approximately 9 million fractures annually attributed to the disease of osteoporosis worldwide. In terms of prevalence, um, there are over 10.2 million Americans with uh, osteoporosis and a lot, uh, four times that, uh, over 43 million with osteopenia. So it's kind of, the, I like to think of that as the step before osteoporosis. Uh, in general, women are greater than 50 uh, years of age, um, as are men. Um, but as you can see, it's a much uh, greater um, incidence in women and prevalence, excuse me. And unfortunately, uh, one in three women and one in five men will experience an osteoporotic fracture in their lifetime, whether or not it is symptomatic. So again, osteoporosis is a progressive deterioration of bone structure. Um, and it leads to decreased bone mineral density. Basically, there's an imbalance between our bone formation and reabsorption. Normally, osteoblasts that make the bone and osteoclasts that resorb the bone are in, in a very uh, harmonious regulation, and this is regulated via our parathyroid hormone. Um, but calcitonin, estrogen, vitamin D, cytokines, prostaglandins, and multiple other factors are involved. Um, as we grow and develop, our, our peak bone mass um, is in our 30s, and um, males will form um, this before females, and we plateau at 10 years. Um, so that's around 40 years old, and that's when our bone formation and reabsorption um, start to equalize. From there, um, so after 40, our cortical and trabricular bone loss um, decline, okay? And um, during menopause particularly, there's a higher rate of this um, bone loss. And for about five to seven years during that perimenopause um, era, and then um, it will decelerate, so uh, slower risk during that time. Excuse me, I, I will say a slower rate of decline postmenopausal. Um, beautiful picture of our um, parathyroid involvement with our um, bone um, and vitamin D um, involvement in our bone formation. Um, and this is from um, current medical diagnosis and treatment, CMDMT. It's a great resource. So there's um, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Um, what we cannot modify is our age, our gender, our menopausal state, our race, our family history, can't pick your parents, um, or a history of a fragility fracture. Okay, what we can modify are um, our weight. So um, if you have somebody who's um, below their body weight, BMI, um, start trying to get them to bulk up. Um, we can modify deficiencies in calcium and vitamin D. Um, we can try to increase physical activity. We can stop smoking. Um, we can counsel 
um, people on uh, decreasing their alcohol intake and um, try to modify medications as best as possible. Steroids are one of the um, most common um, chronic used medications that, you know, for rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory diseases um, when used over a long time is very is a huge culprit of um, osteoporosis. Also, anti-electric drugs um, decrease that amount of um, calcium and vitamin D that we absorb in the stomach, and so supplementation is really important. So be aware of the medications that your patients are taking. Prevention is always preferred or bold to cure, right? Um, so if we know that our patients um, have low bone mineral density, we know that this is associated with a huge um, lifetime fracture risk, and it could be um, over 50% in women and 30% uh, in men. So primary prevention. Um, we need diets rich in vitamin D, calcium, and ongoing weight-bearing exercises. So um, the USPSTF actually recommends against um, supplementation for primary prevention, um, but other associations do recommend it. So, um, you know, um, you can always do a dietary consult and make sure that your patient's getting adequate dietary um, vitamin D and calcium, which is always preferable to supplementation, of course. We want to always encourage lifestyle modifications that will improve um, our risk of um, maintaining our bone density. And that's going to be, again, um, those lifestyle factors like limiting alcohol, um, talk about fall prevention early, and avoiding tobacco. Um, the USPSTF recommends that we screen all women over 65 years of age, and um, also women over 50 with a 10-year major risk of um, osteo osteoporotic fracture. So we can use that uh, FRAX tool. It's a calculator. So if they're greater than 8.4%, some literature says um, over 7%, but um, screening people with uh, who are at risk for those fractures. Um, and then the current evidence technically is insufficient to recommend screening for osteoporosis in men. However, um, the National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends screening men over 70, especially if they have um, one of those risk factors, right, um, which are fragility fractures, um, secondary risk factors like low BMI, tobacco use, etc. We can classify osteoporosis as primary or secondary. Um, Primary is going to be greater in females versus males. Um, and secondary factors are more prevalent actually in males. And so this is due to um, low intake, um, immo immobilization, liver disease, um, COPD, chronic kidney disease, cancers, um, drugs, genetics, etc. How do we diagnose? Um, we will look into, as always, our good old fashioned history and physical exam. So we're going to look at our history, um, to look at the patient's history. We are going to review their modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, uh, risk factors, and then also use our FRAX tool um, to see what their score is if um, they have quite a few. And then um, also look for uh, associated conditions, okay? Um, many times on physical exam, there is no specific physical exam finding, well, you know, we don't have x-ray eyes, maybe one day we will, um, but unless they have a fracture or, um, or a very obvious um, physical exam signs, such as uh, thoracic kyfo uh, kyphosis um, or uh, the uh, exaggerated cervical lordosis, like a Dowager's hump or um, dorsal kyphosis, the poor balance, you know, they've just looked generally deconditioned, kind of stooped over appearance. Um, two thirds of vertebral compression fractures are actually not symptomatic. Um, they just happen over time. And so um, we can suspect this if we have a historical uh, height loss greater than four centimeters um, between their peak age height at 20 and currently, or um, between the last visit, so in the last year, um, if it's greater than two centimeters, it's pretty significant. Um, our differential diagnosis could be broad. Um, you know, we need to be thinking about multiple myeloma, especially in an, uh, somebody older than 60, um, maybe osteomalacia, um, deficiencies in vitamins. 
um, there are some collagen mutations, and then uh, of course there's osteogenesis imperfecta that occurs um, in some patient populations when we are having um, fragility fractures. We need to think about that. In terms of diagnostic imaging, um, you could consider some plain x-rays of the spine. So if you have um, an older person that's coming in with severe back pain, um, maybe they have some localized vertebral point tenderness, you want to look for compression fractures. Um, also, if they've got a um, greater than three centimeter height loss since the last time you saw them. And our gold standard for diagnosing osteoporosis is going to be our DEXA scan, okay? Dual energy X-ray absorptometry. So that's why we say DEXA, DEXA, DEXA scan. All right, this is generally done in the hip or spine. And um, in the cases of uh, a patient that you're screening with hyperparathyroidism, the distal radius is the most common site for bone loss. So that's when we'll use the, the wrist, okay? So these are reported, bone layer density is reported in a T-score or a Z-score. The T-score is going to be uh, the standard bone mineral density that is different from a peak mass in a healthy person. So the, you are matching your patient um, in a healthy person of the same race, gender, ethnicity. Okay. And the WHO, the World Health Organization, defines osteopenia, so thin bones, you know, the step before osteoporosis, as a T-score between negative 1 and negative 2.5 standards from the mean. Okay, Osteoporosis is going to be a T-score that is even worse. Okay, So they're going to be less than 2.5 or, or more. Um, standard deviations away from the mean. Now, Z-scores are generally used for children, premenopausal women, um, and men under 50. Um, and this is a standard deviation of bone mineral density that differs from another person of the same age and sex. Okay, okay. So if, if this person has more than two standard deviations away from the mean, especially because as you can see, this is a young population. We really need to look at secondary causes of uh, disease. So um, this is where we'll probably send off some labs, and we may be sending off labs anyway in somebody with um, uh, osteoporosis, especially yeah, if we're looking for deficiencies. Um, but uh, other causes, um, secondary causes, are going to be your vitamin deficiencies, parathyroid disease. Um, you might want to send a CBC to look for anemia, in which case then you'd go on to send off, um, you know, if it's indicative of um, iron deficiency, um, you might uh, find hemochromatosis. Um, we'll send chemistries to look for other causes. Um, testosterone levels, especially in men, can contribute to uh, osteoporosis. And then, of course, uh, thinking about multiple myeloma or Cushing disease, celiac disease, or other malabsorptive syndromes. And again, you're not going to send all of this at once. You're going to consider your further lab work based on your initiate, initial evaluation, your individualized risk factors, um, signs and symptoms, and your history of your patient, right? So in terms of treatment, um, our, our main goals of treatment, we want to preserve as much bone mass as possible. We want to prevent fractures, prevent, 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 um, and decrease their pain, increase function, right? So all patients with osteopenia or osteoporosis should be um, increasing their calcium and vitamin D intake, probably need supplementation and physical activity uh, increase in that. We need to modify those risk factors that we discussed earlier. We need to um, probably start supplementing with our calcium and vitamin D. Okay, now on our treatment, all patients are still getting cal calcium and vitamin D supplementation, and we're going to start our first line, which is our anti-resorptive drugs. These are your bisphosphonates. They've been around for many years and they work by inhibiting bone resorption by those osteoclasts in our skeletal tissue. Um, now, 
they do have some side effects, um, dysphagia, inflammation, esophagus stum of the stomach. Um, so they, these people can get some really serious uh, heartburn uh, and that can stop them from taking it. And so there's strict rules on how they take it. You know, um, do you take them and you have to be upright for a certain amount of time, etc. cetera. Um, and so um, we also have to take a break after three to five years. So um, they are associated with some atypical um, femoral fractures with long-term use. Um, so we want to reevaluate these people at three to five years, you know, look at their... Um, Look at their bone density again um, and other risk factors, okay? Um, these are the top three probably most widely used. Um, the uh, philodendronate's been around. It's an oldie, oldie but goodie. Um, and with the bisphosphonates, there's a very, very, very small risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw. So we want to encourage um, some dental examinations um, this risk is actually worse in some of the um, monoclonal um, therapies. Uh, for the purposes of our current course, um, we are only looking at first-line treatment, but um, this is just FYI, you won't be tested on this, but um, other treatments include hormonal replacement therapy. As always, if a woman has is a uterus, Estrogen must also be given with progesterone because of the risk of uterine cancer. Um, anabolic agents can be given if they're unable to take the first line drugs. If they, you know, say they have um, steroid induced uh, osteoporosis or um, they just can't tolerate with the heartburn. Um, there's PTH analogs and, of course, like I mentioned, the monoclonal antibodies which do put people at risk for osteonecrosis of the jaw. As far as prognosis with treatment, um, it's good. 80% will stabilize, and um, we can increase their bone mass, mobility, have reduced pain, decrease their risk of fracture, hopefully. You know, unfortunately, uh, without treatment, um, up to 40% of these hip fracture, people with hip fractures um, don't do well. Uh, they, it leads to chronic care and premature death. Um, it's a really bad um, prognostic sign in an elderly person with a hip fracture. Uh, so we want to prevent that. Um, complications of osteoporosis will be um, severe disabling pain, you know, recurrent fractures. Um, those uh, vertebral fractures, it doesn't take much for, um, you know, your little old lady to fall on her bottom and then um, they come into the ER with multiple uh, compression fractures that are actually acute and, and horribly painful. That sums up our talk today. I hope you all have a good day. Uh, these are both uh, great resources, and um, I'll say in particular the 5-Minute Consult has a nice, um, lots of nice algorithms you can use.